Good evening and welcome to the UTV Leaders Debate. Indeed, it's the first debate of its kind in any election in Northern Ireland. I'm Jim Dougal. For the next hour, we'll be putting the leaders on the spot to answer the questions you want to ask. Beside me is the leader of the DUP, Peter Robinson, the president of Sinn Féin, Gerry Adams, the leader of the SDLP, Margaret Ritchie, and the Ulster Unionist Party leader, Sir Reg MP. And we're also joined by an audience of first-time voters. They want to know why they should give their vote uh, to any of the parties. And that, indeed, is the first question. Peter Robinson, could you perhaps, in less than a minute, tell me why the electorate should vote for the DUP? Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, obviously, I do want people to vote for the DUP, and I'll tell you why. This is a defining election. This election will determine whether we keep moving forward or whether they get dragged back. We've come through a dark period of division and conflict. We've had endless negotiations, but we've come out the other side and we have made real progress. And that progress has been due in no small part to the mandate given to the DUP to negotiate on behalf of the people of Northern Ireland. I believe that the progress that we've made has made Northern Ireland a better place. And once again, there is an issue relating to the economy and you have to choose who will negotiate on your <coughs> behalf. I believe the DUP is the team to do that with its experience and with the... Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, Gerry Adams, could you, uh, again, in, in a minute, tell me why people should pick Sinn Féin? Well, this is about leadership. We will decide who will lead us. We want people to look back at the last five years, check out our leadership since the first agreement with Ian Paisley, the wonderful job we've done in the peace process despite some difficulties, the wonderful job that Martin McGuinness has done in the political institutions, which are now fully functioning. It's about equality and it's about in the time ahead preparing for the next challenges which are social and which will be economic. So let's bed down the institutions and use the focus, the energy and the experience of the Sinn Féin leadership to tackle the economy and to tackle inequalities. Okay, Margaret Ritchie, uh, can we come to you now and ask you why do you believe the voters should pick the uh, SDLP? Good evening everyone. This election is about moving on. Now it is time to deliver particularly on jobs. It is about sending good people to Westminster who will work there for all of the people and who will take their seats. The SDLP is the only major party running in all 18 constituencies and the only major party that has refused to engage in tribal pacts because you cannot build a shared future by driving people back into sectarian um, trenches. That's just not leadership. The SDLP has an exciting economic and political agenda to be transacted at Westminster and we are offering good candidates to do that. No. So let's do something different this time. No. Let's okay, vote Margaret. for the best candidates. Margaret, thank you. Um, Sir Reg Empey, could you tell me why you believe you, you can encourage voters to vote for your party? I think there are two issues. The economy, <clears throat> obviously, because the young people in the audience tonight are going to have to pay the massive debt that we are accruing. Northern Ireland is accruing a debt of £13.5 million pounds a day or £450 million pounds for the UK as a whole. The young generation will have to pay that debt in the years ahead. And what we want to do is something different in this election. We are offering an opportunity for the people of Northern Ireland to actually choose who the government of the United Kingdom is. We will be offering an opportunity with our Conservative colleagues in the House of Commons to be part of a government so that when people in Northern Ireland go to the polls this time, they will be voting for people who will form the next government. OK, Sir Ed, thank you very much. Now, can I just go to the audience for a start, please, and let's uh, talk to Chris Andrews, who is going to um, give us our first question. Chris, go ahead. With around half of the jobs in Northern Ireland dependent upon the public sector, what impact do you believe the expected cuts will have upon the local economy? I think he's right uh, there, Gerry Adams. There are going to be a lot of cuts, and uh, you know, on the doorstep, you, people are talking to you about jobs. How can you bring jobs to Northern Ireland? Well, first of all, we don't have enough economic levers here of our own, and the, the the experience of the last five years has been to see more and more power coming from Westminster to Stormont, and we want to see economic powers. We want to see a harmonisation of corporation tax. It should be 12 and a half percent across the island. I think that Mark McGuinness and Peter have done good work in terms of investment from the USA, but we need to see local businesses being 
uh, support it in the same way as inward investment is supported. And we would argue for a task force <coughs> at the executive. We would argue for uh, the, the green economy to be, to be developed. There are lots of uh, opportunities within the environment, but mostly innovative uh, projects using what we have strength in terms of our young people who can come forward with innovative ideas. The yes. banks are not releasing money. They're not releasing credit to small and medium businesses. That needs to be tackled. And we would, and I'm engaged and have been engaged with Invest NI to make sure that it gets its house in order in terms of social disadvantage being tackled. And okay, all of the Sinn Féin departments have built in social clauses. The big capital projects that Conor Murphy is clearing, there's a social contract that people have to get apprenticeships, that there has to be a local oh. labour clause, that long term unemployed have to be part of that. Okay, Jerry, all, Jerry, all those other departments. Peter Robinson, within all that, we are expected. Uh, to find something in the region of a billion pounds of cuts over the next three years. How can you produce a billion pounds worth of cuts and do the kind of things that uh, he, Jerry Adams is talking about, or indeed you may talk about, about keeping people in work? Well, I think we have to face up to hard realities, and any politician that uh, tells you that we can go through the, the next four or five years without having to face up to a number of hard decisions, uh, give them a wide berth. Because the reality is this, that... Uh, the UK now has a debt that is likely to be, by 2014, £1.4 trillion. Pounds. That's costing us over £43 billion pounds every year just to service it. I, I can uh, accept that there are only four ways that you can deal with those issues. You have to either cut public expenditure, increase taxes, sell assets or get economic growth. Now, the easiest and most painless way to do it is to get economic growth. And Chris is right. We are too heavily reliant in Northern Ireland on the public sector, and therefore we have to switch over to the private sector. But that's why the Conservative cuts particularly concern me, because we have already started our financial year, and they're going to bring in £6 billion of cuts, having already started the financial year, the spending programmes already having started to, to run out. And that can only mean job cuts and cuts in services, and that's very dangerous for Northern Ireland particularly. Sir Ed, you have uh, hung your, your hat, if you like, on the Conservative hook. Mm. And they are uh, the party which most of all wants to cut. Well, first of all, uh, every party is going to cut, no matter which party forms the government. So the question really is, <clears throat> we have uh, policies, for instance, to stop the planned increase in national insurance contributions which are due to take place in 2011. There's an extra 1%. Now, that 1% is paid for by the public sector as well as the private sector, and it takes the money directly out of people's pockets. Seven out of ten people will pay that amount of money out of their own wages. That money is taken out of, it's going to have to be, it's public expenditure that we can't spend. So, in other words, it's going to cost the public, private sector more, the public sector more to keep employing the people we do. Where are you going to cut? The second thing is, the... Um, process that we are applying is to in reduce corporation tax. Uh, first of all, the national corporation tax that would be reduced from 28 to 25 and small from 21 to 20. We will also be introducing a paper, a government paper, on how corporation tax at, say, 10 per cent could be implemented here in Northern Ireland to give a real stimulus to the economy. That will mean the power would go to the Assembly and the Assembly would make its decision and balanced decision on whether it goes down the road of a competitive corporation tax rate. The third thing is that we would be removing any national insurance charges whatsoever for any company that produces 10 or more new jobs yeah, in the I, first I year. I think you made that point. Mark, Margaret Ritchie, you uh, have suggested something like 42,000 jobs in three years you're going you're gonna to find. Where are you going to find them? Well, I think Chris and Jim has asked a very important question because our economy is uh, largely based on the public sector. So we have to try and reconcentrate in the economy. We have to be in Westminster in order to try to maximise uh, the block grant for Northern Ireland, which could be faced a major cut of something in the region of 5 to 10 per cent. To create those um, 42,000 jobs that we mentioned in yesterday's manifesto, we, we will be arguing in Westminster, and that's why you have to be in Westminster, um, for a harmonisation of the corporation tax on this island. Um, it's 12 per cent in the south of Ireland. It's something like 28 per cent here, so it needs to be brought down so that we are able to attract more foreign direct investment a greater investment in green energy, a more development 
of the tourism pro product. I would have to say that our tourism um, signature projects are very good. There needs to be more development because tourism is a labour intensive uh, uh, industry. Uh, and also the fourth area, which I know something about from housing, investment in construction. Because in housing, I <laughs> encourage people to build um, Jim, more on our own land. You're all talking about uh, investment and what you're going to do with investment. The fact is, Peter Robinson, that we are waiting for cuts to come down the road. What is going to have to be cut? Well, clearly, if you have cuts, you need to prepare for cuts, and that's why the Conservative policy concerns me so much, because you will be probably about June when suddenly £200 million will be taken out of the Northern Ireland budget. Now, we have ring things, uh, ring things policing and uh, justice. Therefore, 50% of the remaining budget is health. Now, who does Reg want to tell Michael, or will I tell Michael, that there would be 100 million taken out of the health budget? You just couldn't do it without having an impact uh, on jobs. So I don't believe that we should proceed with those cuts this year. You have to prepare for cuts. Reg is right. There is a hard decision to be taken in terms of getting into the, the public sector and looking where the waste is and getting it out. But you can't do that Are you immediately. Are saying you're not going to cut the health budget this well, year? We have, we have said that we shouldn't have any further cuts. We have already had efficiencies in the Northern Ireland budget by 3% year on year for three years. As the Finance Minister, I had to make £790 million of efficiencies in that budget. Every minister around the table, and Margaret will tell you and so will Reg, is already squealing whenever anybody talks about any further efficiencies. We simply couldn't endure another £200 million Jerry, pounds of cuts. Adam's so, well, cuts well, well, in education, well, for all, example. Well, first of all, what we have to do, because all of this is an argument for us to have our own powers here, we have to protect the most vulnerable. We have to protect the elderly. We have to protect children with uh, disabilities and citizens with disabilities. We have to protect people who live in disadvantaged areas. The fat cats need cut. The quangos need done away with. The, 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 the bureaucracy, which has been built up over 40 years of direct rule, need slimmed down, and money needs to go into frontline services. But we need to generate our own economy. Now, I just want to take but a How point do you do that? I mean, how do you by, do by that having without fiscal attracting powers, investments? By having fiscal powers, by having a task force approach, by bringing everybody in and, and uh, promoting and activating. I, I work all, the day, all day in communities, and there are people out there who are eager eager to provide jobs. They can't get credit from banks, they can't get support from Invest NI. The bureaucracy which surrounds all of this is absolutely tremendous. And but the government want, wants to cut more. So well, well it's, you see, this is the British government wants, that wants to keep more. But what we have here in place, the, what we have here in place, the moment. and the big achievement of the last five years was the Hillsborough uh, deal, the Hillsborough agreement. We got, between us, 800 million out of the British Treasury for policing and justice. We did that by diligent uh, work by making a case and by having popular support for what we were doing. I just want to make another okay, point. Very if quickly, if you would. Mark is making this big issue about attendance at Westminster. Well, now, the budget was just recently there, and the budget debate at Westminster lasted for uh, four days. There were six votes on it. There wasn't uh, one SDLP just, MP in sure. attendance. Could I just they make didn't the make point. one you're contribution, get, and they, get, didn't, they didn't take one you're vote. You're going to get the opportunity later to talk about that, uh, Jerry Adams. Yeah. Reg, I see you want to come in. First of all, let's be clear, with the, uh, with the small exception of rates, all the money that we spend at Stormont comes from London. That's the way it is. Whichever party wins the election is going to reduce the amount of public spending. Now, <clears throat> the issue then is how, you, how do you do that? And I believe there needs to be a twin-track policy. We need a policy that will actually generate and promote new jobs. And that means that you have to give the fiscal me measures, i.e. reduce costs by reducing national insurance contributions and corporation tax. We have to give incentives uh, to make business work, to replace the jobs that in the public sector. But the most important thing of all, if people are worried about what a Conservative government might do, then the best thing is to have locally elected Northern Ireland MPs in that government who can actually influence the real decisions because we all the rest of us can do is lobby. Okay, but we want to be an actual part of at it. At that in point, Reg, to put Northern we've Ireland's got to case. take a break. So coming up next, we're talking about hung parliaments, election pacts and party strategies. Don't go away.
Welcome back. Uh, let's go to our for audience of first-time voters again. And it's a question, I think, for you, Jerry Adams, this time. Jerry Maguire from Belfast. What is your question? Uh, Sinn Féin still refuses to take their seats at Westminster. So is a vote for Sinn Féin a wasted one? Not at all. A vote for Sinn Féin is a vote for leadership. It's a vote for the future. Increasingly, I mean, all of these parties are devolutionist parties. They all want to see more powers here. I, I support that uh, fully. At this time, and of a Westminster election, they all exaggerate their own importance. They all exaggerate the influence and the importance of uh, Westminster. And they all exaggerate their own attendance. I don't take my seat because I'm elected not to take my seat. I'm an active abstentionist. These are lazy abstentionists. The uh, voting patterns for the MPs, and Reds doesn't have any MPs at the moment, but the voting patterns for the rest of them is among the worst. There are 646 MPs. The worst attenders are the ones uh, from here. And the SDLP particularly, which is making a great virtue out of this, and this issue was won uh, years ago, is not only among the worst attenders, it supports the, the uh, war in Afghanistan. It has made the point that in a hung parliament that will be crucially important, but it's already given away. If it wins seats, it's given them okay. away because it said it's going to support the Labour Party. So it's, it's, it's done the deal already without anything for that. Uh, Margaret Ritchie, what's your view on abstentionism? Quite clearly, Jim, this is a very important issue. The SDLP have always taken our seats in Westminster. And why do we take our seats in Westminster? Because we believe we have to be there when it counts, where it counts, particularly on Northern Ireland business. Um, Jerry makes an assertion that we voted for the war in Iraq. Could I nail that lie? Back in March 2003, our then three MPs, John Hume, Seamus Mallon and Eddie McGrady, were the only Northern Ireland party to vote against the war in Iraq. And my memory serves me right, it was around about the 18th or 19th of March. And Let's the not get record too far there. into, into specifics, but I do I take the you point. support the war in Afghanistan. And if you voted against the war in Iraq, it shows you how little influence you have. But Jerry, can I ask a qu one other question? Well, what is the whole point of abstentionism? I mean, you once wouldn't go into the Doyle, you wouldn't go into the Peacing Board, you wouldn't go into a British Irish parliamentary body, uh, you wouldn't go into a stormant within the UK. Now you're in all three. So the question is, when are you going to go into the cause, Westminster? Because we're not going to go into Westminster Ever. for as long as we get a mandate not to go in. But look, well, England's a nice place, but it's not my country. I'm Irish. This is my country. You know, and we can argue about all of that. I don't want to take an oath of allegiance to an English Queen, and I don't want to see British Indeed, jurisdiction. But when the MPs in go the into, the, into the, the, the voting lobbies, you're not there. Well, the MPs have had no influence. If I, I mean, if I could argue this out to, to, to the cows, could I mean, well do we, have this time. Uh, well, well, hard, here's, tell here's, me how they could. Well, here's a man here who, if he if he won uh, a seat in South Antrim, could, as I understand it, be a member of the cabinet. Well, if he is, good, if he is, good luck to him. <laughs> but but let's come back to the <laughs> real politics. Well, well, no, no, I want his real politics. No, but before we go his real politics, but let's live in the real world. Right, Reg, yeah, yeah, the answer to the question really is that I, I think abstention's a mistake. It is a policy from which Sinn Féin has been steadily retreating, uh, for, as Jim has pointed out, from each of the different forums. And I think that people go unrepresented. We have huge challenges if we even take the situation in Fermanagh with Quinns and so on. Many, all of those issues are actually still controlled from London. You need to have the influence. But the other thing that we have been campaigning on for the last year is an end to double jobbing. Because the reason why there's poor attendance rates is because people cannot be in two places at once. Really and as far as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I think Peter's the only uh, one of his party who's intending to stay in Parliament, but you physically cannot be in Stormont and in London at one and the same time. You've got to choose. So as far as I'm concerned, well, you give the representation uh, and you, be, uh, you have one job and you do that job. People are struggling to keep jobs. We have, so we have, we have, one we have here a First Minister who's jobbing. in, in, in yeah. Stormont and Westminster, <coughs> sometimes pretty close to the same time. Well, I've been speaking on the floor of the House of Commons uh, an hour and a half after speaking uh, in the floor of the, the Assembly, uh, which shows that it is additional work, and I agree with Reg, it's something that does have to be uh, phased out, and we're in the job of doing it and giving the lead in doing it, and I hope others follow that, uh, that lead. Uh, you're right, of course, that Reg could be made by the uh, leader of the Conservative Party if he was to become Prime Minister. Reg could be Chancellor. Equally... David Campbell could make him go through the, the lobbies and vote for cuts for Northern Ireland. And I leave it to you to decide which of those two is more likely. 
But the, the reality is that we are facing into a hung parliament. That's a massive opportunity for Northern Ireland, where small numbers of people can make all the difference, and they can exploit that for the sake of Northern Ireland. That's is what it, I want to do. But is it much better because uh, you will have great power for a week, mm -hmm. but at some point a government is going to have to go in and you're going to have to say, I'm going to support you with my whatever number of votes. No, that's not what we're doing. You can't support uh, him in one issue this week and a different can. issue the next week. Well, because if you, you didn't, can, in the meantime, you might In the House power. of Commons, we can decide where to vote on the basis of the merits of each issue. And that's what we'll do. Clearly, constitutionally, the largest party, in fact, the government party, will have the first opportunity of forming a government. That's the way constitutionally uh, it is. Uh, and if the government wants to, to ask us uh, upon what issues will you give support, we'll tell them. And therefore, they can leave issues that they don't know that they will have support in the House of Commons Mar to the back. Okay. Margaret Ritchie, if you're uh, uh, there with three MPs, who are you going to support? Well, first of all, um, we will be supporting Labour for government, but that doesn't mean we have supported Labour on everything in the past. For example, um, we opposed Labour when they wanted to do away with post office card accounts. In fact, my colleague Mark Durkin um, laboured very hard at Westminster to ensure that the pensioners in Desmonds um, were able to get the money to which they were entitled. And he secured himself through amendments to the legislation that that was possible. There was also the other area we lobbied against the closure of post offices and the, we lobbied against um, the withdrawal of childcare voucher schemes so Jerry is saying a little mistruth or an untruth when he says that Westminster doesn't matter it does matter when it comes to Northern Ireland business and the impact of those cuts because you have to be there to challenge those where do cuts. You, where do you do your Northern Ireland business? We mostly do it here and we also do it in Downing Street. But I, see, I battled for the best day on Ford workers directly with the British Prime Minister and uh, we won that just gains for them with the workers who occupied the factory, but, but also gains for workers in Britain itself. And I just want to come back to this point uh, that Margaret Very made, quickly. where she said she doesn't support the war in Afghanistan. The SDLP we, said they're representative okay. to Afghanistan, who, who went Let, there yeah. and who, 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 who went Let's. there to observe military operations and was paid for by the Ministry of Defence. Okay. So this is how you hook up into the British system. I just want to deal with the hung parliament issue because, yes, go ahead, because first of I all, a, a, the last yeah. thing we need at the moment is a, part, is a government that can't function. We're in spiralling debt. Secondly, people seem to forget that if a hung parliament did, did arise, the other people in the UK who are, who are looking for a hung parliament, the Scottish nationalists and the Welsh nationalists, what are they going to sit and do? In other words, you can't assume that simply it just applies <coughs> to people from Northern Ireland. There will be all sorts of people out there. So okay, nationalists well, want a hung parliament because they can then influence things fine, which uh, are, is not in the interest of the union. I understand union. the point you make, but let's stick with this. And uh, um, to you, Raja, and, mm. and uh, to Peter Robinson, you accepted a pact in Fermanagh South Tyrone. You did. Uh, isn't it a bit rich for you to say that that's a unique situation? That's different to the situation in South Belfast. Well, first of all, the issue in Fermanagh has been, we've just been talking about it, one of representation. Uh, I mean, that constituency has been left high and dry uh, since 2001. Um, a, a candidate uh, emerged uh, with a, an impeccable track record, uh, who incidentally is going to, uh, has committed himself to taking the Conservative whip in Parliament if elected. And I think the general upsurge uh, in, in opinion on the ground uh, left us uh, in the position but that we had a candidate who uh, had, we believed was capable of attracting vast and widespread support right across okay, the country. But I understand all that, but why is it so more, much more unique hmm. than what you were asked by the DUP to do in South Belfast? Peter. Well, it's not. The template could have been used in South Belfast. I was speaking today to our people in Fermanagh, South Tyrone. They've been going round the doors and the reaction that they've been getting by the sight of having unionist unity has lifted everybody's spirits in that constituency. And so it would be right across the province if we could get our act together. So I hope, irrespective of the fact that we haven't been able to do it for this election, I hope we can in future elections. It's vital that we do. Are you going to go for unionist unity after this election? I believe that it's in the interests of the union that unionists work together and cooperate better. Margaret Ritchie, pacts, you're against them. Yes, the new politics of Northern Ireland, and in fact, as young people at the doors are saying to me, they want to move into a new politics, which is about bringing people together, about sharing. 
and the very thing that is alien to sharing is the forming of election packs. If I give you a very simple very example, quickly, um, people say, why don't you stand aside in Fermanagh South Tyrone? Why would you stand aside in Fermanagh South Tyrone for a candidate and for, and for somebody who is not going to take their seat. It's an issue of representation at Westminster and representing and That's serving the needs of the people. Jerry Adams, Peter was it a trick Peter. you were at when you, no, when not you offered all. It was a genuine first. effort. I tried to meet Margaret on it for reasons incomprehensible to me. She refused to meet me. That she is refused. incorrect, Jerry. No, you did. She yes, refused to even return. Another re mistruth. She, she refused even to return That's phone calls. But let me, let me get down to the nub of all of this. See, Peter has given people the best reason possible for returning a strong Sinn Féin team. Because what he's after, as we come up to the next assembly elections, which is a year off, is to try and get a unified uh, unionist position, which is absolutely legitimate, and I applaud him for his efforts in that. There's nothing wrong with PACs. Our objection to what happened in Fermanagh South Tyrone is that the midwife was the orange order. That's our objection. And Alex Maskey showed okay, exemplary well, leadership yeah. and standing to one side and giving the SDLP a clear uh, run. And Margaret should you, stop insulting okay, the electorate, the Republican electorate. Hey, Jerry Adams, I think you've you? made your point, Margaret. Yeah. We'll have to come back to it later. Could, right, could now, right now, we're going to take a break. Uh, coming up next, expenses and scandals. And indeed, can you trust our politicians? Stay with us. Welcome back. This parliament has been one of the most discredited parliaments in history. All parties have been tarnished by the expenses scandal. I want to talk about that now. But first of all, Carly Green is in the audience as she, she has a question to start us off. Carly. Hello. Um, I'd just like to know, with all the recent scandals over expenses, um, how can political leaders inspire young people to vote? Indeed. Margaret Ritchie. Thank you, Carly, for that question. There's no doubt that pol politics and politicians have been damaged as a result of last year's discussion, last year's uh, dis uh, at Westminster, about um, expenses and about scandals. But there is an important duty on, pol on politicians and the political process to restore confidence in it and to encourage young people like yourselves um, to come out and vote. As a new political leader, one of my first tasks was to appoint a whole series of young people, many of them women, to be junior spokespersons because I believe there's a lot of capacity with young people to go out there and serve. And it's about putting the issue of service, representing people on the needs and issues that, th that interest sorry, them. Would they be less likely to fiddle their expenses? Sorry? Would they be less likely to fiddle their expenses? I, don't th I think that is a, quite a contentious issue, Jim. I think the issue is one of restoring confidence in the political process and saying that politics is an honourable profession and it's about restoring the issue of service, about helping people, about delivering people and about okay, bringing thanks, a better uh, way of life. Okay, Margaret, thank you. Reg Empey, how would you clear, clear this mess up? Well, I think uh, uh, politics uh, is in serious difficulty on this. Uh, Parliament has been a disgrace. It's number one item on the doorstep. People are disgusted. And I think that whether we, we deal with uh, expenses claims that were totally unjustifiable for pens at £305 when a 10p big bar would do, where we had uh, situations and we've had land deal accusations and all sorts of things have cropped, in, cropped up in the last 12 months. I would say to young people this, Carly, that one of the things, while it might turn you off and undoubtedly has turned a lot of people off about what has happened. I believe that it should be actually an incentive to young people to participate to help clean it up because at the end of the day if we do not deal with this issue through transparency we're going to destroy the democratic process and I think it's almost number one issue with people. They're disgusted when people are struggling to find jobs on short time hanging on and to see all of this with people with their snouts in the trough it's totally unacceptable and unfortunately it the, even the innocent politicians are getting tarred with the same brush okay as they thank you peter robinson you uh, yourself have been touched by a scandal in your own family over finances i'm not going to ask you uh, about your wife she has resigned but arising from that there are two inquiries pending uh, two of them are pending the outcome of police reports are you completely satisfied that you have come out of this with a clean slate well, 
I hope we do get the opportunity to come back to the uh, House of Commons and the expenses uh, yeah. issue. But uh, on this matter, let me take it on head, head on. The inquiries were set up because I asked them to be set up. Yeah. I was the one that called for it. First of all, I sought to have legal advice from the Crown Council. That legal advice was received. The chief of uh, the political uh, reporter for the Ulster Television has seen it from beginning to end, and he has publicly indicated that it completely exonerates me. But it's unpublished still. Well, we, we can't because the Departmental Solicitor's Office won't allow it to be published for legal reasons. Okay. Uh, so I would be the happiest person in the world if it was published, but your correspondent has seen it and has already indicated that it gives me a clean bill of health. So I, I'm looking forward to the outcome uh, of those various reports. But on House of Commons expenses, let me say this. I happen to be one of the minority of MPs who got uh, a report from the auditors that were brought in uh, and they indicated that I had no issues arising from my expenses for five years. So I could sit and polish my halo here if I wanted, but I believe that every politician needs to put up their hands because around this table every one of our parties has people who did have members reported, every one of our parties. Uh, and I'm not talking because Reg has now aligned himself to the party of duck houses and moats and manicured gardens. I'm talking about Ulster Unionist members are in that leg report. So all of us need to be contrite. All of us need to apologise to the public and all of us need to have a new way forward so that the public can but build trust The fact trust is again. that those two inquiries are still pending and, and in, in terms of those, you don't know what is going to come out of them. If they're pending, how could I know what's going to come okay, out of them? Other that. than the fact that, that, that in detail the matter has been examined and I have been exonerated. There is a, a more recent controversy, and I don't think that it has been answered. Why did Fred Fraser, who uh, was a very astute businessman, sell you, and also a very astute politician, a piece of land for five pounds? Well, first of all, he didn't. The position is simply this, and let me touch on the, the facts of this case. I decided to sell part of my back garden. It's legitimate that I should do so. I'm entitled to do it just as long uh, as anybody else would. The BBC's own report indicated that I got the market value. The BBC's own report indicated that I had an access for myself if I wanted it. The developer asked if I would approach Fred Fraser to see if he was prepared to release that piece of land which would have assisted neighbours beside me. I did that and he did it. I made not one penny profit on the transaction. But it was a straightforward transfer. Why did you get involved in it at all? Because I was asked to, Jim. Yeah, of course you, you I, I assume that uh, if you, somebody asked you to do something, that you'd be willing to help them as well. Well, I might, but, but why, you, you sound like a middleman. Well, it's hardly a middleman if I help somebody who asks me to, to uh, effect a, a transfer, which in no way has helped me financially. OK. Jerry Adams, um, could I just come to you now? And I, I, uh, I know that you have had troubles with your, your brother. Uh, uh, has this been an issue on the doorsteps? Well, let me answer Carly's question first, yeah. and I'll come directly well, well, to that. Please, I will, please, absolutely. Yeah. Just, yeah. just let me answer it. Sinn Féin don't draw down personal expenses from the public purse. We don't get paid salaries for Westminster, and all of our representatives only draw down the average industrial wage. And I know that people on the dole, young people having to pay huge loans as they go through university, single parents and elderly people are just absolutely flabbergasted at the type of expenses that some MPs were drawing down. On the question about my brother, anyone who has raised this with me has raised it, and it has been a very humbling experience for me, in a totally sympathetic way, because they understand the awfulness of child abuse, of trying to deal with it in a family situation, and also having to deal with it in a public way. So people have okay. been entirely sympathetic. Let, let's move on, because you have, uh, and I'm bringing this up again, you have always denied being a member of the IRA. Uh, even though some of your friends and some of uh, people who might have been considered themselves your comrades have claimed that you were. Uh, you have also suggested that the last two former members of the IRA who said you were a member, that they uh, had questions to ask about their health. That was Dolores Price and Brendan Hughes. Now, I accept what you say. You're not a member of the IRA and never were, but I'm interested to know why you weren't. Well, the same, the same reason why you weren't. Because life goes like this. The, 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 I don't distance myself from the IRA. I don't associate myself from the IRA. I, I'm not casting any aspersions 
upon any of these uh, individuals. I think we've come through a huge uh, period in all of our lives in which, you know, for example, the unionist parties were heavily involved <coughs> in creating paramilitary organizations or working with paramilitary organizations. Everybody All presumed us, you were the leader of the Republican movement? Well, well, everybody may presume whatever everybody wants to presume. All of these issues were very, very public and were rehearsed very, very widely. We are invited let, to let join. Finish, Did anybody finish, ask you, let, say, let, Jerry, would you join the IRA? Let me finish, Jim. I'm standing in this election. It's a voluntary action by me. Mm -hmm. So the electorate will make a decision on all of these matters. I stand on my integrity. I stand on what we have done in transforming this part of the country and, and what we want to do in the future. We have built the peace. We now want to build prosperity, jobs and unity. And I'm standing here or sitting here asking you a question about this election. That is, were you, were you ever invited no. to join the IRA? Well, I never was, just when you, when you mentioned that. But, I mean, my, my role in Republican politics predates the most recent resurgence of the IRA in 1969. I'm one of those people who was active in Republican politics from 1964, 1965. But look, people are not concerned if I may say so. Victims of the IRA may be, and certainly opponents of Republicanism are. But, okay. but, but the, what the electorate are concerned about is that we don't lose the peace to these groups masquerading as the IRA, and that we face up to issues of economic disadvantage and inequality. Right, well, look, um, we've heard Jerry's point before. I mean, I have to tell him, and he know, he'll know this. I know of nobody uh, that I represent actually believes it, I have to say. Um, but there it is. He says what he said. But we do have to move on, and we have to remember that we are threatened collectively by renegade IRA elements out there yeah, who I'm want to bring I'm us back to, come to, that, sure. to uh, the position that we have just left. Yeah. So we'll have these arguments going forward, and we'll have arguments over... Uh, land deals and all of the rest of it. See, that's the second I, time you've mentioned land yes, deals. Yes, it what is, because mean? what I'm getting at is this, and, and Peter became annoyed with me about this. Um, I, when you talk to people, people just don't understand why anybody, would, a particularly <coughs> a property developer, would give you a piece of land for effectively five pounds. Because don't forget, there would be costs associated with buying and selling that land of maybe a couple of thousand pounds because of the, the, the solicitor's fees and so on. And I had suggested to Peter that it would be better that he did what he did earlier in the year, set aside, stand, stood aside for a short period while that was sorted out. He would come back stronger, we would all come back stronger. And I just felt that that was a way of dealing with it. But if so are you asking Peter Robinson well, to step aside for well, a few months? Uh, what, no, uh, the time is irrelevant. The, the fact was he, he decided to step aside before to, as he put it, get advice and get his name cleared. The, the fact is that people just have an issue with this, how can anybody be given okay, access we, we to the land? Point, I think it's uh, fairly cheap politics, to be honest, uh, from Reg. And uh, I suspect that if this wasn't election time, we probably wouldn't have heard a, a chirp from him on this uh, issue. The, the facts are very different. On the first occasion, the allegation against me was that I had breached the ministerial code. There is no accusation made against me, and I dare anybody to make an accusation against me in relation to the second issue. I had to obviously satisfy myself and satisfy the Deputy First Minister, who asked for legal opinion uh, as well, that I had not breached the ministerial code. The evidence came back very clearly to us from three separate legal opinions indicating that I had not breached the ministerial code. There is no ministerial code issue in relation to this matter, and Reg knows it, and everybody else knows it. It's all right to make innuendo and insinuation, but there is no allegation against me on this issue, nor could there be. Margaret Ritchie, very quickly. We go to oh, I think there is every need as a result of this discussion, Jim, to restore honour to politics. Jerry has clearly answers. He's denying his former colleagues, Dolores Price and Brendan Hughes. And uh, Peter has questions to answer as well. No, and the public are expecting answers to those questions. And maybe there should be well, separate inquiries. Sorry, maybe what there the should question? be what? Maybe there should be separate external inquiries. And who should ask those questions? Well, those questions should be asked by an independent arbiter. Are you asking for another inquiry? I'm asking for a separate external inquiry because politics is an honourable profession and we must ensure that that honour is restored. Jim. Very, very quickly because I have to go, go to Why does Margaret break. answer the question about an STLP representative being in Afghanistan observing military oper operations and the cost being picked up by the Ministry of Defence? Jerry should answer his own questions which we he has are, left unanswered. We, we, we'll stick with this just after the break but uh, for now Come back and join us soon.
Welcome back. Um, I just want to stay with the issue of integrity in politics. And I want, first of all, to go to uh, Reg Ampey. Do you believe, Reg Ampey, that there is integrity in politics here? I would have to say to you that after the last year, uh, I think colossal damage has been done. I think public confidence has been weakened. And uh, I mean, I, I bet most people I have met are much more skeptical about politics and politicians than they were a year ago. You couldn't have made some of the stuff up, Jim. And I think we all, we all have a responsibility and we all have to shoulder some of the blame. But uh, we've a long haul back to restore public confidence. Do you have an answer of how to get back? Well, I think there are a number of things. Transparency is one of them. I mean, the, the basic issues of, publicing, of, of, of um, publishing expenses, I think that is a start. I think the rules have to be absolutely clear cut. Uh, so that there's no uh, ambiguity about them and I think clearly there was ambiguity in the past and I think basically over time um, the public have no difficulty in giving politicians the tools to do the job nobody objects to providing them with the resources and the equipment to do the job it was because it got abused because the capability to abuse it was there that You're I think is beginning to run out thing. of time but there's some issues you want to discuss Margaret Ritchie can you take that as well please integrity in politics integrity in politics has to be restored because everybody needs service and it's our duty and responsibility and obligation to provide that I put my heart and soul into my job because I love representing and delivering for people Right, Peter, you were asked at one, one occasion there to maybe stand down again. Uh, you were asked uh, for another inquiry. What's your answer? Well, I'm not going to deal with the, uh, the cheap points that have been made. Uh, I came into politics in the 1970s. I don't believe anybody that came into politics in the 1970s did it for any rewards or what they could get out of it. I have at all times working 16 hours a day for my constituents, dealing with tens of thousands of cases on their behalf. I have always done it to the highest standards and the highest levels of probity. And I, I resent anybody suggesting otherwise. Uh, and even if for cheap political points at election times, some people think that they may score it. I think you'll find, as Adelie Stevenson once said, those who throw muck always end up losing ground. Jerry Adams, uh, yeah, I know you wanted to come back in. Well, the, the issue has been raised and about people not answering questions. I answered the question. People yep. may not like my answer, but sure. I answered the question. I put a question okay. to Margaret. Why on earth was Thomas Burns, an MLA for the SDLP, sent to Afghanistan to observe military operations, and the cost was met by the Ministry okay, of not, Defense? Uh, yeah, that's a hugely important issue because well, you know, this is the same Ministry of Defense that, that tried to nobble we, the Sovel inquiry. Okay, but, well, why I does do, Margaret answer the question? Well, we, we, we do have, we're out of time, that's the reason. For my reason, anyway. Okay. Uh, we are coming towards the end of our debate, I'm afraid, and uh, there is one question that, that I want you all to address, and it's very much your final thoughts in about a minute, if you could. And the question comes from Gareth Ross Brown. Gareth, where are you? What does the panel lab believe is the biggest single challenge facing them as leaders, and how will they deal with it? Okay, Margaret Ritchie. The biggest, ch uh, biggest challenge, I think, facing all of us as leaders is to restore confidence in the political process. Since I have become the leader of the SDLP, I've tried to do that through renewing the SDLP, bringing in a whole raft of new people, bringing in um, young people, women, ethnic minorities, is to try to address ourselves right across the community, put service back into uh, the profession of politics and ensure that people come first and that you're delivering for people. Thank you, uh, thank you Margaret uh, Bridge MP. Well I think uh, obviously delivery uh, on the policies that we put forward and we have uh, joined forces with a potential party of government so that we when people in Northern Ireland vote they can actually really participate in a real election voting for people who could form the government. Mm. The other big challenge we face and we're making strides in it is to get more involvement of women in representative politics because that Very is a huge good. challenge for politics and we are certainly making strides in this election with some excellent uh, women okay, candidates. Okay, Jerry Adams. We are the party which has more women in the Assembly than any of the other parties. Big challenge, providing consistent leadership, bringing in equality for the elderly, for people who are carers, for rural communities, for fishing communities, for young people. The, the people, for example, in education who have the least uh, attainment and education are Protestant boys. Those youngsters need equality and that's the big challenge facing us to turn all of that around. Okay, thanks Jerry Adams. Now, um, Peter Robinson, please. Well, by the time I had reached the age of the young people in this uh, audience in Northern Ireland, 
was already engulfed in violence and fear and destruction and death. We have now come through a very difficult process and we have a real prospect of stability, peace and prosperity. That has to be worked for. That's the job that politicians have in the future and that's the most important job for us, to keep Northern Ireland moving forward. And if people vote DUP, that's exactly what we'll do. Okay. Leader, thank you very much. And that concludes the first ever party leaders election debate in Northern Ireland and I hope that you are now more informed than you were an hour ago. My thanks to Peter Robinson, to Gerry Adams, to Margaret Ritchie and to Sir Red Gentry.